you know, something's going on. Well, just to kind of go over a few things, um, one of the things that um, our goals for this session here is, is that um, one of the things that we can celebrate about our music community, you know, we have great Cajun and Creole heritage, we have a great community who participates in dancing and arts and, and festivities, and from the music side, I know Chris and I and, and Anya and um, it's one of those things that that's what makes our community unique. That's what makes Lafayette. That's what makes Acadiana. I uh, said that one of the council meetings, without investing in our culture and our arts, or coming up with create, we're doing our community and our heritage a dis disjustice. So, what what we want to talk about here? Are what are things that we can celebrate about our music community? What are some of the biggest challenges, and how have we overcome challenges or what can we overcome and what are some good case studies or examples of what is possible when proper resources are prepared for our culture and uh, recreational community. So, um, Kareem needs to know what we have already available so we can be smarter, more strategic and more efficient in how we leverage those resources. Um, also, you know, collaborative efforts and partnerships uh, that we see emerge between the organizations represented would be awesome. You know, pulling every resource in together and utilizing uh, those resources to help continue to promote our Cajun culture and heritage and our Creole and our language. And I know from my standpoint, uh, I think the thing that is probably lacking the most is the language. Uh, there's kids around the corner picking up accordions and scrub boards and fiddles and guitars, but it's not too many of them are focusing on the, the actual language, and uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm kind of guilty of that myself. When I was younger, I should have took up uh, Professor Barry Ossoli's idea to go and, and go study French for a whole week, a whole month, and uh, I guess I enjoyed playing the card and I played baseball, and I guess my team needed me to pitch more, but ultimately that did suffer, because as I was recording, a lot of people would come and say, well, you know what you're singing about? And at the beginning, I didn't. I did what every, everybody else does in college and school. You start learning how to memorize. But then when your grandparents pull you aside and say, okay, that's enough. You know, if you want to become a better singer or you want to bring your music and touch people's hearts, they have to hear the passion. They have to know you know what you're singing or what you're talking about. So I made a 360 and then put more emphasis on, on the language side. And I'd like to see more efforts on the language. We still need to get the music out there without a doubt, but I think for our younger generation and for this community to succeed as the older generation passes away, us musicians today and the younger ones coming up have to understand the language. Maybe they might not be able to spell it and, and be grammar, but they have to know the language and know what they're talking about so that that culture, that aspect of create, or the aspect of what brings people to Acadiana cannot solely be just about the music. It has to be about the language and how the, song, the songs were created and what the stories were about. So that's, that's, that's where I feel we're lacking in the community is more of the language. Uh, I see young accordion players coming up. Cajun French Music Association had a festival, so they had a lot of accordion players. Uh, they have a few fiddle players coming out. One of the other instruments, I don't see a whole bunch coming out of steel guitar, but there there are a few. So, but that because of the recordings that you know Anya and Chris and everybody here puts out, people are always gonna love the music. But I'm trying to give the younger ones the French, and also at the same time trying to lure them in with a good Zotico tune or an English tune. But at the end of the day, what is the main goal for our community? Is the language and all the pieces. So. I'm gonna stop talking and I'm gonna let Chris say a few words. But um, no, no, I'm good. I, I talk enough. I'm good. Um, that's that's just my aspect. That's some of the things I've learned going on the road and being part of the, the Cajun culture and uh, the heritage. And um, I think music is probably has always evolved. And, and and just when we think young people are not gonna be playing music, next thing you know, 
there's a, a, a young kid coming around the corner, and, and most of the young ones today, I have to say, are speaking French and they're they're singing real well. But um, we have to make sure we do, do not lose the language. Is, is my point about the whole thing I'm talking about? So, Chris. Uh, for those of you who do not know me, I am Chris Ardoin, a Zydeco musician, originally from Lake Charles, Louisiana, but now residing in uh, Lafayette for the last, oh, thank you. The last uh, six, six or seven years I've been here. He, he is a resident of District 1, so I do appreciate yeah, it. Right, right, right. <laughs> um, I come from the uh, legendary Ardoin family, who was known as the first family of Creoles. My grandfather bought sec back here on the corner, um, a relative of Amelie Ardoin, who was the Father of Creole Cajun music. Um, my my goal in life is to travel the world and spread our culture to everybody. And I've been blessed enough to be a part of a family that I was born in, and it was destined in me. I would travel. I started playing at the age of four. I played Carnegie Hall in New York at nine. I played at the Monument in Washington D.C. I played for the president, and this this was all before I could actually realize what I was involved in. You know, at a young age you kind of really don't see it. And now, especially now that I have kids speaking on the language that you were speaking of, I would like to see more of the young kids speaking French. And not the French that they teach in school. Because I know a lot of kids that learn French in schools and then when they go to talk to my dad and our uncles and people they're, they're like, you're wrong, that's not right. That's not right, because for example, magazine is a store, but to us, it's a barn. So I would like to get the Creole, and, and even with Creole, you gotta realize the dialect is different depending on what areas that you're in. If you're in St. Martinville, you can understand somebody from St. Mamu, Yuba's area, but some things are, are slightly different. So I mean, in teaching the French language, I would like them to kind of, you know, learn the whole thing overall, which is kind of broad, I understand that, you know, but I would at least like to see some effort in that. Um, another thing that I've realized that I think we need here is more emphasis on family-friendly venues and events, because, like I said, my kids are six and three, and most of the Zydeco clubs that, that I grew up playing in no longer exist. So we're, we're, we're having to strictly do nightclub events and they're not really family friendly which in trail rides we still have trail rides but the scene trail rides have changed dramatic, dramatically over the last five six years so they're not really family friendly events either but we can get it back that way um venues like Vermilionville, nice establishment but the creoles have never really been represented in my opinion you know, and when they do do the Creole music, it's not, it's not the music that they should have here. I think they're the, the quote unquote safe bets that they go with, you know, like they may listen to my music and say, oh, he's not playing Zydeco, he's not, he's not doing this, but you realize that the music that I make now, I created to get to the masses, but understand that I know where the music comes from, and no matter where I play, I do play the traditional stuff. So if you would bring me here, I'm going to play the traditional music and I'm going to take you to the journey from back when my grandfather and I were able to play it until the current times. And I think that's misrepresented, misunderstood when they, they think of the Zydeco. So I think the Creole heritage needs to be represented as well everywhere. And I think that's, that's what we're lacking. So I think that's all I have to say for now. <laughs> my mind's always running. I'm always thinking of stuff. So I, mean, you know, I may come back later with something else, but that's where I'm at. Bring in great points. You know, you talk about children. My children just asked me that they have a daughter that's 12, little daughter that's about to be 11, and my little boy is six. And we used to play uh, Mulots and Palm Rose and the Randalls. And, um, you know, first thing they say was, Dad, we, we, we hardly get to see you play anymore, you know? And uh, it kind of upsets me because that, that is a part of passing on the torch and, and getting them in that environment. And thank God for places like this and, and uh, Cafe Des Amis and you, you, your other places that you can you can play with. I, I think you hit the nail on the head with we're both in the same agreements with the language and the culture and you know um, or, or even with the Creole musicians teaching our.
kids and the younger generation, the Creole music. Because now when we tell them play an old school song, you know, like something Creole, they're playing some of my stuff I recorded in 1995. And I'm like, no, that's not it. And a lot of the musicians, accordion players now that are coming to play in Zyco, don't know how to use the bass side of the accordion. They just use the one side. They use the one side. Because they're trying to adapt to what I was, or not even adapt, but they're, they're only playing what they've heard today. And I gotta realize, they, they've been born in the 2000s, 2005. So when they started listening to Zydeco, it was all the stuff that I recorded with the keyboards and, and everything. And I'll take responsibility for that. And I'm making efforts in, in changing that, but they don't, the, the young Creole party players don't really know the old school music. They don't know my grandfather. They don't know Amadei. They, I mean, they don't, they don't know the Cajun musicians either. And that's the one thing that I would like to, to see change also. I mean, we were talking about family friendly events. I grew up playing church hall bazaars. Like the church hall dance is still existed back then. Every weekend we were at a church hall, there was a bazaar on Saturday morning or Sunday at the church. Those don't exist anymore. So when I say even family friendly events, like we never had venues before, but the church dances and the church bazaars were our family events. So when that folded, now we're left with nothing but clubs. Right. And, you, and, and you, you kind of forced to that, you know. The, right. But as artists and as as uh, musicians, we're always looking for that to be creative. That's in our blood. So at the same time, I feel like we have to step outside the box and, and be creative and get people to come and dance and enjoy our music. But we cannot forget where that creativeness came from or who inspired us or where it came from. So it's like you have to be creative, but you never can forget your roots or where you come from. But it's to get the younger generation and the people out there to understand the Chris Ardwans, the Kevin Knockhans, the Steve Rodgers, the Magnolias. We all, we, we've all learned from the past. And we try to bring it up to attract the younger generation, but we don't want to lose sight that it's just about the dancing. It, they, they need to know the stories and the roots and how these musicians and how they recorded and how they lived and, you know, played dances for 10 cents and walked half, three miles with their party in a rice sack. I mean, there's so much more history that is involved that we just have to somehow reach out via partnerships or whatever. But, uh, it's, and once we get there, with, with the culture the way it is now, a lot of people come to Louisiana. They want the culture. And when you say the culture, they just, they, they strictly go to food and music. And I would like to see, especially with the, with the Zydeco, I would like to see us represented well. When we have opportunities to get the commercials, we have the opportunity to get the movies. I don't want to see a band from Texas or a band from, with, from, from, maybe even from here doing a Zydeco spot. I mean, and not to say that we're going to split and go black, white, Cajun, Creole, but if you're going to get a Zydeco band for anything, at least have it be Creole people. That's my argument. Because you won't see me doing a Cajun commercial. You know, my, my biggest beef with the Popeyes commercial is, you know, I'm a Cajun girl. I'm like, you're not a Cajun girl. This is a black lady. Like, and just because you're black don't mean you're Creole. But I'm just saying, it. like, if you're going to do the commercial, at least be correct about it. So I would also like to see that represented well. Gotcha. Pass the torch. Uh, well, you know, uh, and listening to what you guys are saying, and I work uh, with the music media and music business programs at uh, UL, which we have uh, over 100 students just in those programs, and probably 90% of them are from this area. So it's a lot of youth coming from this area in these programs to explore how to uh, do music production and how to make money in the music business and how to you know, make a living uh, exploring their art. And, and you guys talking about family friendly venues, it was really something that was kind of on my mind because this community provides an opportunity for young musicians to perform, right? With, uh, so Roddy Romero Long, right? If you're under 21, you can perform in a lot of venues, but there's not a lot of opportunity for their peers come here and play. And I think that that's something that's missing in our community is uh, more all ages or family friendly venues so that we can uh, support these these young artists as they come up in this community. And there's a lot of talent. I really feel like culturally and 
as a community that we're very supportive not only of music but for art and dance and, and theater. Um, so the, the children and the young adults get an opportunity to explore their creative side and get supported by the adults. But a lot of times when they're performing, they're performing for an older crowd and not the crowd that would be most attuned to what they're doing musically. Uh, and I really think there should be a, a larger opportunity for uh, these, these young adults to play for their peers. Absolutely. Anya? Is my fiddle ready, by the way? Still ready. <laughs> um, my name is Anya Burgess, and uh, I'm a musician. I play with the Magnolia Sisters and Bonsoir Catan. Um, and then I also own a shop downtown on the corner of Jefferson and Vermilion across from the ACA. It's called Solo Violins. Um, and it's a full service violin shop. We do sales of instruments, we do rentals, and then we do service. We do a lot of uh, all of <laughs> customer on stage. Um, so I guess my role in the music community, you know, just kind of straddles those two sides. You know, I'm both like a, a musician and I, I work on, you know, hundreds of musicians' gear, um, what they use to make a living with. And so I can kind of keep them, you know, keep them um, in shape with their instruments and their bows and all that, which is cool. I love, I love my job. I mean, so much. Um, as a musician, I've, uh, like these guys, I've traveled the world playing Cajun music. Um, it's been amazing and enlightening um, to see, you know, how well Cajun music is received in other parts of the world. And I think a lot of people here don't, you know, they why would they? They don't know, you know, the Cajun music has been worldwide, and it's it's just such a cultural asset uh, that we have here. Um, you know, there's Cajun music festivals in parts of the world you wouldn't expect. <laughs> and, you know, there it's like what other state in our country um, has festivals devoted to that state that is like in France or something like a Louisiana festival in France. And there is I can't think of another state that has that. <laughs> it's just such a cool thing. Um, and uh, I think that. You know, it's one of those things where if you're in the middle of it, you don't appreciate it as much. Um, but when you get out and you see that like Cajun music or, or Zydeco music um, is just a, a, such a cultural asset worldwide, it's just, just amazing. And, you know, very cool. Yeah, I don't see too many Texas swing bands going overseas and other states and parts of the country promoting their music and I tell people often you know uh, Louisiana and this area should be very proud because there are people that are given everything they can to have our culture in their own state and for a festival or hiring bands to go play uh, blues festivals I mean our culture is very unique and it's something which you just hit on it's kind of we spoil, we take it for granted. You hear it every weekend, you, you, you can catch a Creole Zotico band every night just about on the weekends, you can catch a Cajun band, and, and we, we just take it for granted. And people outside of our area would love to have what we have. So I think it's partnerships, I think the community, I think we need to find ways to preserve it and actually just not be, don't be complacent, just don't take it for granted. You know, we have to continue to push our heritage, our culture, and find ways to get the message out. Um, you know, we have a university here. I love Raging Cajuns. I graduated from them, but uh, I don't see too many Cajun and Creole Zotico bands getting to play for tailgate, you know? And yet you got people traveling, the visiting teams are coming to Lafayette, and Raging Cajuns, and uh, I can think on maybe one hand, a few few Cajun Zotico bands had an opportunity to showcase our culture, you know? Basketball games, I mean, I seen in the study books that um, who was a fiddle player's name that played for a halftime show uh, years ago. Dennis. Dennis McGee, you know, so um, those are other avenues that, you know, I think we can tap into our university and, and utilize those those things, you know, whether it's uh, having the, the band for the Raging Cajun band learn a Chris Ardoin song or a Kevin Nockin song or a Mac. I mean, just simple things. It's probably 
it's not thinking outside the box, but it's that's some things that I've always thought about. Like, why don't we utilize those opportunities when you have teams traveling to, to play in, in Lafayette? You know, uh, promote the culture. Um, so I get, to, I get to see a lot of tourists. I'm right in the middle of downtown, so I, I get to see a fair number of tourists come in and. Um, and one of the things that has crossed my mind is like more cultural businesses downtown would be so wonderful because that is what tourists want to see and they have spending money they're, they're like ready to you know like spend money on on our culture and yet downtown there's you know a, a couple of cultural businesses but if you know if we're giving incentives to these big corporations to come you know locate in lafayette why are we not giving some incentives for cultural businesses um, that are actually like supporting the local economy, um, you know, anywhere in Lafayette. So, um, one of the challenges, I guess, from my personal experience is that I'm like really a musician first, um, and I went to violin making school and learned how to work on instruments, but I had no business training, like zero. Like when I was in college, the thought of taking a business class was just repulsive to me, honestly. <laughs> Um, I was ignorant, you know? and so when I, you know, I had this business of, of doing violin repair um, on a very, you know, homegrown scale in my house for like 10 years, and when I decided to take it to the next level, like open a retail store downtown, I had no experience with like what it takes to have, you know, have a small business, really, like that wasn't my little pen and paper accounting uh, that I had been doing. So, you know, I think, you know, when we're talking about, like, what, what support could we provide to create more cultural businesses is, like, um, you know, so incentivizing or training people who have inclination to, to open these businesses, you know, like, accounting and marketing and inventory and pricing, and, I mean, everything that I had to kind of, like, figure out. Um, uh, yeah, a lot of people have great ideas, but like to actually take your idea and make money at it is a whole other thing. So, I don't know, I guess, you know, with this summit kind of talking about what could we do, um, those are just some ideas. Great ideas. Kevin has a question. Um, sure. I'm going to try to make sure you all have enough time to entertain some questions. You and Chris talked about some um, interesting issues as it relates to what kind of ties into marketing. So two questions. Um, first is, uh, I'm friends with the Dopsy family, all of them. And it's often said, you know, they've established themselves a really great base in New Orleans, for instance. So the question, the first question is, how do um, you all balance or, or I guess compete against the market as to say Southwest Louisiana is really, um, the market has really been saturated. There's a lot of bands, a lot of activity, a lot of people getting in your demand sometimes become greater away from your home base. Whereas you find yourself traveling more to entertain as opposed to being able to stay home. And number two, Chris, specifically for you, um, what is it that we can do or, or how do we get that balance to make sure that the, the true art form, the original art form, your grandfather's art form is maintained and how can an artist balance chasing the funds by bringing in the new styles versus maintaining the culture and heritage we create is going to be committed to? Um, well, first, uh, that's the, as far as balancing, I think the, the, the knowledge is first, is understanding where it comes from and understanding how to play it. Now, with, with Zydeco, it's a little different because Cajun music really hasn't changed from day one. Like, it's, it's still pretty much, you know, roots, you know what I'm saying? Like, well, with Zydeco, you listen to Zydeco, like with my grandfather, the Creole music that my grandfather plays, what we play now, totally different. It's totally different. So, my fight, especially coming with, with my, my heritage, is finding a balance of still showing them where it comes from, but being able to feed my kids. You know, so for, for me, it's just about educating the ones that are coming up, because like she was saying, we get to travel all over the world. And one thing that's different with what we do 
Because when we go to festivals outside of the state, we do workshops. Because people are so interested in what we do. So with that, we have to explain where the music comes from, from day one. Explain the instruments, explain the food, explain how we live, because they're interested in everything. So to, to me, it's just educating people from here that want to get into it. So it's like, if you want to you start playing Cajun music, if you want to start playing Zydeco, then you have to learn these things first. To me, I think that's, that's the, the first step to at least finding that balance, you know? Um, as far as for the, the market being saturated, I mean, it's, it's hard to say. Uh, is it saturated? Do you have a lot of bands out there that are so eager to get their name out or play so they cut their price and they cut it to the dirt where musicians like myself and Chris and Anya have paid our dues and played the dances for $50 a man and played all that. Yeah, that's a lot of that. There's a lot of that going around, you know. Um, and then our local people just devalue what we actually are worth and what we have become as an artist and where we come from, starting on the ground floor, working your way up. I mean, I've been playing now twenty some years, and I can tell you now that I'm I'm just probably hitting my peak with my fan base and getting the money that some some people that we deserve, you know, in the thousand dollar ranges or more. And you have a lot of the younger ones that are the, the bar owners or some of the festivals, they're on a budget and I get it. So they'll settle. So when I say this the market's saturated, it's it's saturated, but you have your top tier Creole, Zodico bands, Cajun bands that have started from the bottom, that have know the knowledge, have paid the time, learned, studied the language, and are at a point where the dancers and the followers are coming, but it becomes, becomes a money issue. And when it becomes a money issue, our, for whatever reasons, without calling out anybody's names, just in general, they, they'll they go for the cheaper band. Just because, well, we got so many bands, it doesn't matter, I can grab this one for this price, even though this band is worth what he's asking for. That is what made me open my eyes up and say, you're gonna get a college degree, you're gonna go find a job, you're gonna get in the medical field, and you're gonna, you're gonna serve your community. But for Kevin Naki and for me to strive and support my family strictly on music, I, I, I just couldn't, I'm not saying I couldn't do it, I'm not saying that I, I'm not good enough to do it, or my, my band's not good enough to do it, but I, was, I just, I guess it was all how I was raised, and, and that has allowed my music to progress because I'm able to do it because I want to do it and if it doesn't do good or it, it flops, it really doesn't matter because I have a job. So when it comes down to these other people that are devaluing the bands and they want to go for cheaper, it is because the market's saturated. And, and the one thing that we have to fight, you mentioned uh, Rock and Ducey, man. People that hear them and then they hear Gino Della Falls. And then they'll hear me. And they're like, well, well that's not Zydeco. There's a festival here, I won't, I won't say which one, that wouldn't book me and they finally, people kept requesting, get Chris, get Chris. And when they called me, the first question he asked me is, you playing Zydeco again? And I'm like, when did I stop? So when we're talking about marketing and all the bands, they have to understand that all Zydeco is not the same, you know? And just because I had a keyboard here doesn't mean that it's not Zydeco. When Clifton added Buckwheat on Larkin and he had the trumpet players, that didn't mean it wasn't Zydeco. Because I don't have a fiddle doesn't mean I'm not playing Creole music. So when I was talking about educating earlier, that's also one area that I would like for them to understand. Like, it's, it's, it's broad. And even with the Cajun music, you know, yeah, if they can see a man with a the scrollboard the player, they're like, wait, you're not playing Cajun music, you got a scrollboard, that's Zydeco. No. It's I have a uh, comment and a question right here. Thank you. Kenneth sort of uh, went where I was going to go with my question, but I want to rephrase it a little bit. This morning we talked about what he, what he just said and that it's sort of a knock on our community and that all of you have to travel to, to uh, make, make a living. For me in tourism, that's a good thing because you're an ambassador for me every time you travel, promoting our area all over the world. 
But to follow up on Kenneth's question, you know, what does a community, our community look like if we are able to get to a point where where you don't have to, to travel so much uh, um, to make a living? What you know, what what are some tangible things? And I know you mentioned we can't really influence what a bar owner is going to pay you, but are there other things that we can do as a community? If, if anyone wants to speak to that. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm blessed enough now that every Thursday through Sunday, I'm somewhere between New Orleans and Houston because Zydeco is really thriving here. The problem that we ran into is on, once you leave Louisiana, there are more Zydeco bands outside of Louisiana than there are here. So now, while the Cajun bands may still be going to Lowell Festival or, you know, to Safeway Blues Festival in Portland, they're using their own local bands. So I think if, if we, we... They're doing that on, on the Cajun stuff too. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, we go to California. And, and they're, they're actually pulled, they're doing both. They're, they're so playing with their own. Cajun Psycho band. So now we're getting kicked out of our own culture. So they're doing these Louisiana festivals with right. no Louisiana bands, no Louisiana food. These are people from up there that are called the, you know, the John Lyon Brothers. Yeah, yeah, you know. And, and I think we need to get a hold of that ourselves. You know, Cajun A Creole, like get together, we need to get in control of our own culture and stop letting people from outside of the area dictate what we are. I think more things like the Balfa camp, more 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 of those things that Dewey Balfa was so great at doing, but you know, you do that and you partner up with the Chris Ardwans and, and those those Creoles so you can get people from out of state flying into Lafayette eating our food, getting the real culture, getting the real music, getting the background of it, and then letting them go back home. And then they'll learn real quick that with well, that festival, yeah, if you call it another Cajun Zydeco Festival, but we're not seeing this, you know. Yeah, we're not represented. We, exactly, we're not represented. So, I mean, for an artist, um, I think there's some, there are some things that we could do better here and then low and, and keep our musicians here making the same amount of money we make on the road. Because you're right, I can remember years ago when Gino was more popular on the road and couldn't draw nothing around here. And then all of a sudden, you know, there's a cycle, it changes. And then now he's making more money here. And so he doesn't have to go other states and play these festivals. He does, but he's actually making more, just like Chris, making more money in that Houston uh, to New Orleans circle didn't happen to get on a plane and travel. Can we have a time for a few more questions, comment? Sure. Uh, time has run out. Uh, let's kind of make short right here. Just wanted to make more of a comment than a question, but it's something that Chris touched on and a conversation that he and I have had. Uh, and I think it's important to at least uh, make the comment on record so that, uh, you know, for documentation purposes. But Chris, you spoke a little bit about the misrepresentation oftentimes of particularly the Creole culture. And I want to focus not on the misrepresentation away from here, but more so on the misrepresentation by us, by the people who oftentimes represent us. And I think a lot of times we don't put a whole lot of thought into uh, what we're doing because hey, it, it's, one, it's one brochure, it's one commercial, it's one song. And we don't realize when we misrepresent who we are as a community, then that becomes uh, a tailspin. That, be that rolls downhill. And so with each passing misrepresentation becomes truth to the world. And so then we find ourselves oftentimes trying to explain who we are rather than just being who we are. And so I think the most important part of fixing that is to do what we're doing today. And much of that can be fixed with inclusion. And um, I think CREATE is a great first step in that direction. I'm excited to see Chris involved in this, but he and I were talking and he said, you know, how many times do, do functions like this happen and we find out about them three months after they've come and gone and we had no representation at those meetings. And so these things are very important when we can put people at the table uh, who know who we are because we live it each and every day. And so I applaud the administration, I applaud you guys for doing this, and we just would hope that 
this is the beginning of something uh, that is all inclusive. And uh, I think that would really be a tremendous help. Yes, uh, that is the beginning. And you will be hearing from us many, many more times. Another question. Yeah, uh, it's also a comment, uh, and I'm with this uh, gentleman right here. I think this is something that's really going to uh, take hold. It's got T. We've got great backing behind a great organization. But also, I wanted to say, I think it's also on a community level to add, to realize the value of the music. We are too uh, used to go and see you guys for free, okay? Um, so many times you are asked to play for free, and that, uh, as I constantly tell people, you know, how are you going to buy your groceries? You know, I know there are benefits you need to play for free, and there's always giving back to your community. But as a community, we need to realize the value of our musicians and pay that extra money at the door and make sure it goes to you guys, you know, and pay more than five dollars to get in as a cover charge. I mean, for God's sakes, you know, you work more than that. But adding that value as a community to know that um, most people would say, oh, they would play for free anyway. Yeah, but they shouldn't. You know, they have to pay their groceries. And so, again, as a community, giving, making sure we value, we don't just clap, we need to throw money. Gotcha. Start throwing. <laughs> Start somewhere. Yeah. The, the other thing we'll probably have, we've got about two minutes left, is you ask how the community can step up. Um, the, the smoking thing, you know, that, that is a major step for musicians and for the community because for a lot, a lot of times, like Chris, I've heard people say, Kevin, I love your music, but I'm not going, I can't deal with the smoke. So. I'm not going to get long-winded on it. I'm going to just tell you that that was something that I had to look at it from a business standpoint and, and from a, a health standpoint. And I, I figured that the health was the way to go. And uh, that is the right thing to do. But that has, I'm anxious to see what impact that's going to have. Now, do I think you'll see a greater impact if that was passed throughout the parish and not just in the city of Lafayette in an unincorporated area? We're working on it. in the Scots, Broussard, if everybody would do that? Yeah. You know, you'd be surprised how many more people can we get from the community that will start coming out to pay the ten dollars at the door, so they can finally listen to the music that they loved but never had the opportunity to come out. I agree. I've been playing since I was four. I've been in the clubs since I was four. I'm deathly afraid of getting lung cancer, and I don't smoke. I don't drink. I don't do anything. But I've been like even now. A couple of months ago, I played at a, at a club here, over fourteen hundred people in the place. And I could only see the people that were directly in front of me. It was so far away from the smoke. I mean, I'm, yeah. I'm glad that that passed. One more Hopefully question. it doesn't affect right. our, you know, what we got going on. One more question. I hope it's a short one. 